Hey guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan and welcome back to my video channel. Thank you so much for joining me for another video in our Rust programming tutorial playlist here. Hopefully you are learning a lot by working through this playlist. We cover a lot of different Rust topics. And in some of the recent videos that I've done, we've actually delved into some third party crates like the AWS SDK for Rust, for example, that allows you to work with AWS cloud resources. We've also looked at Async Tokyo Executor as well, the small executor for Async as well and survey and a bunch of other things but we're going to stick back with just kind of the core rust ecosystem in this particular video so we're not really going to include any third-party crates here we are purely going to focus on this concept known as cargo workspaces now as your project gets larger and larger and larger right so far we've just been dealing with single crates standalone crates where we instantiate a new crate, we open up that project directory and we just start customizing the code inside of that singular crate. But as your project grows, you're gonna start having more and more crates. You're gonna need to separate functionality into you know, crate one, crate two, crate three. Maybe you've got different crates that deal with different components of something like a game. So you've got maybe a crate that has the game engine. Maybe you've got one that has the game world. Maybe you've got one that has player related assets. Maybe you've got another crate that represents different enemy characters or non-player characters inside of your game. There's all sorts of different functionality across lots of different large applications. So it's really up to you as a creative developer to come up with the structure of your project that makes the most sense for your application development team. So in this particular video, we're going to focus on this feature called Cargo Workspaces, which does exactly that. It gives you this tool that allows you to organize different crates, but treat it as a singular project so that you're not constantly having to context switch across different crates within your project. Could you imagine having a project with maybe 20 or 30 different crates and one of your buddies comes over to your desk and says, hey, can you help me out with this bug? in crate number 12 and you're currently working in crate number four well you have to you know close out your editor or open up a new editor and then open up that other crate just so that you can take a look at the code that your buddy is currently working on in a completely different crate than what you are currently focused on rather than going through that kind of challenging process or that time consuming process we can actually just take the entire project the entire application across all 20 or 30 different crates and we can treat it as a singular project and really manage that project at a step above the individual crate level. So there's going to be a couple of different resources that we are focusing on here. The first is in the official Rust programming language book here. It's just a document called Cargo Workspaces over under chapter 14, specifically 14.3 here. And the other resource we're going to be mentioning is the cargo book here. So there's actually a separate document called the cargo book, which uses the MD book tool to generate the static site here. And so right here under workspaces, this is going to be section 3.3 in the cargo book. So there are a couple of different documents. The one that is in the cargo book here is a little bit more of an authoritative reference. But if you're looking for kind of a description of how this feature works, then the Rust programming language book is really going to provide that best reference. Or even better, you could just watch this video and continue through the end and hope Hopefully this will give you a better understanding of what capabilities are built into this cargo workspaces feature. Also, I will mention that features in Rust are constantly evolving. So maybe in a year or maybe in two years, this video could potentially be out of date and out of sync with how the features work. So if that is the case, I apologize, but I can't really predict the future. So hopefully I'll be able to create a new video if any features change significantly as it pertains to cargo workspaces. But if something doesn't work, don't just assume that it's broken. Just assume that maybe a new feature has been released or maybe a feature changed or something like that. So just keep that in mind as you're working with workspaces. 
Now, what's interesting about workspaces is that there's a couple of different types of workspaces. The first type of workspace can actually be a crate itself. And a crate has a name, a crate has a version, a crate has properties that describe it like an author, a description field and things like that. But there's actually something called a virtual workspace as well. And that's where we create a cargo.toml file that doesn't actually define a crate itself. So it doesn't have a crate name. It doesn't have a crate description. It doesn't have a crate homepage. It doesn't have authors or anything like that. It's literally just going to declare this workspace section, and then it's going to reference child crates inside of the same directory. In fact, I don't think they even have to be in the same directory. They could be in some other directory, but basically this points to the file system paths, the relative paths on your file system where those files are located. So kind of root your mind into this cargo.toml file that's going to serve as your workspace file. And then think about from that file's perspective, where in the tree of my file system are these other cargo uh, crates created, right? So is it one level down? Is it at the same level, but one folder over to the side, like a sister relationship or sibling relationship? Um, you know, where exactly on the file system is it? Is it maybe a step up and then over and then back down? So you want to be thinking about that from this workspace files perspective. So when we create a workspace, we're going to go through a slightly different process. We're going to create an empty folder like normal, but rather than just going through and doing a cargo init process to create a brand new crate, this time we're actually going to manually create that cargo.toml file ourselves, and then we'll define the workspace. And then after we've declared the workspace crates that we want to include, then we'll actually go ahead and initialize those crate directories. But before we actually jump into the code sample, I just wanted to invite you to subscribe to my channel. Your support is incredibly helpful as I am not directly compensated or sponsored for any of the videos that I post on my personal channel here. So go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Also leave a like on this video if you learned something new by the end. Also, please leave a comment. Let me know what you thought of the video. Let me know what other kind of topics you're interested in seeing on my channel, whether it's Rust related, preferably, or if it's some other topic like maybe PostgreSQL or MongoDB or, you know, there's a bunch of different technologies that I kind of have in mind that I want to eventually cover on my channel. But for now, I'm having a lot of fun with the Rust topic. So we're just going to continue down that path and kind of play it out. So also check out the Rust programming tutorial playlist down here. So this actually has a bunch of different videos. We're up to 36. This will be the 37th video in this playlist, and it covers a ton of different Rust fundamental topics here. So hopefully these videos are helpful to you in your Rust learning journey as it has been for me to actually go through and create these videos. The feedback has been really great thus far. So thank you guys so much for your support. All right, so let's go ahead and actually create a project now. So we're going to switch over into our preferred editor, which is, of course, Microsoft Visual Studio Code. And I am connected to a remote virtual machine. It's got uh, basically an Ubuntu Linux virtual machine running on a LexD server. It's a bare metal host that's sitting in my house. And so basically, this is just a virtual machine that's running, and I'm remotely connected from my Windows 11 desktop workstation to that remote virtual machine by using the remote extension here for VS Code. So I really strongly recommend going this route to either use remote SSH or to use the dev containers feature as well. So if you'd rather just develop inside of a Docker container, you can use dev containers and develop in a local or even a remote container as well. Um, but in this particular case, I'm just using the SSH extension to connect directly to the virtual machine host. So what we're going to do is create a new project directory. If we hit control tilde in our keyboard here, that'll open up the terminal. And I'm just going to manually create a new project directory. Normally we do cargo new uh, to create a new crate, but this time because we're creating this virtual workspace, we're just going to create the directory manually. So I'll call this Trevor dash workspace for now. And then we're going to open that up inside of our editor here so that we can use the file explorer inside of VS code to work with that. So let's just do a search for Trevor workspace here and get that opened up. It will cause the window to refresh. So don't be alarmed at that. All right, so as you can see, we have an empty directory here. We don't have a git version control directory. We don't have a cargo.toml file. We don't have our 
SRC directory where we typically have a main.rs or lib.rs file, depending on if you're creating a binary with an entry point versus a library that you can load into another Rust application. But what we're going to do for starters is just click on the little new file button and call this file cargo.toml. Note the capital C in the name. And what we're going to do is just define this section here called workspace. Don't call it workspaces, <laughs> call it workspace. And then what we want to do inside of that workspace is define this members attribute. And it's an array of the crates that we want to include as part of this virtual workspace. You don't have any obligation to specify all of the crates. If I had maybe 10 child folders, each containing a crate in my project directory, I'm not obligated to add those in here, but you will see some problems when you try to run certain cargo commands. So if you do run into those issues, then it's probably because one of those crates hasn't been added as a member to your virtual workspace. So what we're going to do is just define some members that don't exist yet. So the square brackets here indicate that this is an array value because, again, we're adding zero or more crates to this virtual workspace thingy. So what I'm going to do for starters is just create one here called my app 01. So this would be maybe a binary entry point that we have not yet created, right? And then I'll put a comma to act as my array separator. And then I'll add a library like Trev lib 01. Okay. So what we're going to do here is create a binary application with an entry point so we can run it like a CLI tool, but we're also going to create a library that we can load into the CLI tool here as well. When we've looked at crates externally in the past, we've generally imported them from crates.io. So if you head out to your web browser and go to crates.io, this is the community registry here that contains a whole bunch of different crates that like Surday or, you know, Tokyo or Ratatouille, which is actually something I plan on creating some videos about here as well. But typically you're going to be loading up these crates from the crates.io registry. But in this case, we're just dealing exclusively with local crates on our local file system, right? We're not going to be installing any crates from the crates.io registry. So in order to utilize this cargo workspace functionality, I don't even need internet access. As long as I have the Rust toolchain already installed, I don't really need to be able to get out to the internet to download any assets, right? So just kind of be aware of that as you're working with this. So now that we've defined these members, we need to go actually create these members, right? And I'll show you what it looks like if we create a crate, but don't add it to the list of members. You'll get this little warning message. It's not really a big deal, but it is something that you should be aware of as a Rust developer so that if you see that warning message, you can very easily understand why it's happening and how to resolve it, right? So what we're going to do is come down to our terminal here. And we're going to create a couple of new members. We're going to say cargo new. And I want to make sure that I am in the context of my root project directory here. So we'll say cargo new my app 01. And that's by default going to be a binary crate with a, an application, a main.rs file and a main function, not a library. But then the other thing that we need to do is create a library called trevlib01. So what we're going to do is say cargo new trev lib 01 dash dash lib. And so now you can see that we've created both of those projects right in here. One of them is going to be a library. So trev lib 01 has source lib.rs. And it by default comes with this little add function just to demonstrate how you can export a public function from a crate and then import it into other crates. So we might use that in our application. But then right up here, we have my app 01, which has the main.rs file with the main function, right? So now we have both of the crates, but you probably saw that we had this other warning, right? We had this warning that says some crates are on edition 2021. And as of this recording, that's the latest edition of Rust is the 2021 edition. And there's a couple of different versions of this thing called the resolver. And the resolver is basically how the Rust or cargo, I should say, kind of locates different packages. And so it's saying here that edition 2021 defaults to resolver version two. But because we are using the 
workspace feature right here. It says virtual workspaces default to using Resolver version one. So if you'd like to resolve <laughs> this warning here, what we can do is actually just go back to the cargo.toml for the virtual workspace. So that's going to be the cargo.toml that's at the root of your project right here. And then we'll go ahead and just add in another setting here called Resolver equals and then in string quotes there, double quotes, I should say, we'll just put the number two to indicate that we want version two of the resolver. All right, so now that we've got that, one other thing you're gonna notice is that we get a cargo.lock file here at the root. And we also, under target here, under the debug directory, we have a shared target directory. So when we are managing multiple crates using a cargo workspace, we actually get to compile and test and manage all of our crates inside of that virtualized workspace using the centralized target directory here. So here's what's really cool, right? This is kind of benefit number one of consolidating under a virtual workspace. When I do a cargo build operation here from the root of my virtual workspace here, Cargo is automatically going to look for this cargo.toml file. That's our virtual workspace file. And then it's going to look at the members here and it's going to say, oh, I see that you've got two different members here. So I'm going to go ahead and build both of those member crates, right? So if you had a list of 20 or 30 crates here, you don't have to run 20 or 30 separate cargo build commands. You can literally just go to the workspace root and you can run a single cargo build command and it'll build all of those projects, which is a huge convenience over having to manually build each of those or create some huge script file that goes into each directory and does a build against each of those separate crates, right? So this is some really nice array functionality to deal with lots of crates. Also, if you do a cargo test command here, so we don't have any tests defined in our binary application, but once again, you can see that it actually dynamically discovered Trevlib01 and MyApp01, and it executed any tests. There's only one test right now under Trevlib01. If we open up lib.rs, you should see that there is a test module right here that tests out this add function that they include. This is just some example code. So you can just delete all of this and then build your own functions or data structures or traits and then export those if you want to. But this is just some nice sample code that is already written for you. All right. So something else that you can do with crates aside from or I should say virtual workspaces, aside from just defining them as members, is you can also set default members. So there's another property that you can set in here. And I think if we take a look at the cargo book documentation right here, and you'll see there's kind of a reference here of all the supported properties. So you can choose default members. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna take a subset of the members that you've declared under the members property right here. And anytime that you run a cargo test or a cargo build, Build, command, things of that nature, it's only going to operate on the default members. Maybe there's some like utility crate that you don't really use very often, or you just use it on an ad hoc basis in order to you know, manually run some code. Well, that's fine because you can just exclude those utility crates by omitting them, by basically leaving them out from this list of default members. So let's say, for example, that, you know, most of the time I just need to compile and run my application here. And so I don't really need this, li this library very much, right? So what I could do is say default members, and then we'll go ahead and add a default member here for my app 01. And so now, because we haven't included Trevlib 01, we're only going to operate on my app Zero one. So if I come down here and do something like cargo clean, that'll clean up my target directory at the root here, and then do a cargo build, check it out. We only compile my app zero one because my app zero one is the only crate in the default members. But then you're probably going to say, well, how do I build all of the crates? What if I do actually want to build all of the crates that are members of this virtual workspace? Well, it's actually really easy to do. There's a couple of command line arguments on cargo here. If we do cargo build dash dash help, you can actually see under the package selection part of the documentation right here. Don't use all here because this is deprecated, but just focus on package and workspace. If you want to build a specific crate, then you can use dash dash package or just dash P for short, lowercase P. 
And if you want to build all of the crates, all of the members that are declared under the members section right up here, regardless of whether they show up in default members, then you can just do dash dash workspace and you don't pass in any value to that argument. So if I do cargo build dash dash workspace, that's going to build everything under my members list right here. And it's just going to ignore the default members here. So you can configure default members if you'd like to and just configure the crates that you use most commonly that can reduce your build times because you're not building extra code or updating extra code that you don't really worry about most of the time. So just be aware that that feature is available. Another really nice feature of using cargo workspaces is the ability to inherit metadata. If we take a look at some of the keywords that are supported under this section called workspace.package. So if we come back in here right now, we just have a section header called workspace, but we can either do package dot, you know, property name here, or we could actually create a separate dedicated section called workspace dot package. And then under that workspace.package section, we can actually define certain pieces of metadata that we want to apply to all of the crates inside of this virtual workspace, right? So we can set something like the authors, right? If you're the only developer of a bunch of different crates and you just want to set those universally, you can set it at that virtual workspace level and it'll apply to all of the crates inside of your virtual workspace. Same thing applies for things like the addition. If you want to set the addition to 2021, you can do that. If you want to set the homepage URL to your personal website, you're more than welcome to do that as well. So let's take a look at how that actually works in practice, right? So under this workspace.package section right here, we're going to do something like homepage and we're going to set it to my personal website called rustup.dev. And we want this homepage to apply to both my app 01, a binary crate or application crate. And we also want it to apply to Trevlib 01, which is a library crate, right? So what we can do is configure it to actually inherit those settings. So what we'll do is go into our crate specific TOML file and we'll say under the package section right here, we could say homepage dot workspace equals true. So let's go to my app 01, go to cargo.toml. You can see we don't currently, actually we do have a package section right up here. And so what we can do is say homepage dot workspace equals true. So that'll basically enable inheritance for this child crate. And then we'll just go ahead and copy that setting and we'll do the same thing for trevlib01. We'll go into cargo.toml and we'll just paste in that same setting and that will enable inheritance so that if I publish trevlib01 or my app 01 to the crates.io registry, the home page is going to be set to the home page that I define right up here in my virtual workspace, right? So this is a really nice way to basically replicate metadata. It kind of uh, does a dry, don't repeat yourself, right? Where you basically define this property once and then you just set it to inherit at the individual crate level. So that's a really nice feature of using these virtual workspaces. All right, so I think that's most of the features that we were talking about here. I did just want to show you, though, what the kind of development workflow looks like. So let's say that we have a virtual workspace here configured just like so. I did also mention that we'll take a look at what happens if you create a crate that's not going to be included in the member list. So let's do cargo new my test lib 09. And as you can see, we immediately get this warning that says compiling this new package may not work due to invalid workspace configuration. So if you get this error here, basically it's just telling you that it's fixable by adding my test lib 09 to the workspace members array. So it literally tells you right here exactly how to fix it. So once again, right up here, we go into our array, just include that extra library. And then we can do a cargo build workspace, and that's going to compile all three of those crates. But back to what we're going to talk about here. If we had our main.rs file here and we want to use the functionality from these other libraries, well, it's really, really easy to do because these are all part of the same workspace right here. What we can do is just go into our main function here and we'll just do print line, put in a placeholder, and then we can do my test lib zero actually let's do trev lib zero one and then we'll be able to call 
the add function from there. So if we do trevlib01 add and then do like 5 and 10, for example, for some reason that isn't resolving. So let's just go to the root here and do a cargo build. As you can see, it looks like it's not finding that lib. And of course, I completely forgot the other thing that I was going to talk about here, which is how to actually add local references to other crates. So the thing I forgot to do here is, of course, to go into the cargo.toml file here. And under dependencies right now, you can see we don't have anything, right? We haven't imported any crates into my app 01. So my app 01 doesn't know about any of the other crates inside of our virtual workspace. Only the workspace knows about all the crates. So if we want to include either my test lib 09 or trevlib 01 into this crate, we need to do a cargo add, but there's a slight change on the parameters. So normally we just say cargo add Tokyo, you know, features full. We could do cargo add small. We could do cargo add ratatouille. We could do all sorts of things from the crates.io registry. But what happens if that's a local file system path? Well, things change just a little bit here. If we say cargo add and then say trevlib01, what do you think is going to happen? Well, as you can see, it did actually resolve that because we have the virtual workspace. But something else that we can do if we have a directory or a crate that's not part of the virtual workspace, so Cargo doesn't know how to find that crate. In this case, it does because it was just able to look it up in the list of crates in the Cargo.toml here. But if we had a crate, let's do Cargo new Trev lib 07. All right, and we're not going to add this one to the workspace members here. So then what we'll do is say cargo add, cargo add trev lib 07. And as you can see, it's actually going out to crates.io, the metadata, and it's trying to search for a crate called trev lib 07 on the crates.io registry because cargo doesn't know about any crate called trev lib 07. We created it, sure, but we didn't make Cargo aware of it by adding it to our workspace members. So Cargo doesn't know how to resolve trevlib07 here. So what we can do is go back to our cargo.toml for my app01 here, and you can see that trevlib01 was successfully added. And under the JSON payload here, or it's kind of JSON like payload, you can see that path is a relative path. So it's basically saying go up one level and look for a directory called trevlib01, and that is where you're going to find this crate. But how do we do the same thing with another library that's not part of the workspace configuration, like trevlib07 has not been included in the workspace members? Well, if we do a cargo add dash dash help, you can see that for the source right here, something that's actually really cool is you can actually include Git repositories as inputs as well. So you can actually add a crate directly from a Git repository, which is actually how Golang works. If you've ever done any Golang programming, you actually can just add a Git URL and Golang, the compiler, will basically just suck in that package from that remote location. And so the Cargo CLI and the Rust toolchain supports that feature as well. But in this case, we're dealing with local file system paths. So what we can do is say dash dash path. We'll say dash dash path and then say trevlib07. So now trevlib07 was added to the list of crates that can be used by my app 01 as well, along with trevlib01, right? So if it's part of your workspace members in cargo.toml at the root here, the, the virtual workspace file, then cargo knows how to resolve it. If it's not part of this list of members, cargo doesn't know how to resolve it. So you have to specify the dash dash path parameter in order to tell it exactly where on the file system it's located. And then if we go back to main, you can see it's no longer complaining about trevlib01 because it resolves it from its cargo.toml file in the local my app directory here. So now if we just do a cargo run and check this out, I'm actually doing cargo run from the root of my project. I'm not doing it inside of my app 01. I'm doing it at the virtual workspace level. And if I do cargo run, the virtual workspace sees that I have a binary project called my app 01. So it actually just executes that. And so we were able to reach into the trevlib01 crate into the lib.rs file right here that ultimately got compiled. 
and executed, but we have this add function that's publicly exported from that crate. And so our application was able to suck in that crate from the local file system directory and run the add operation of five and 10 together and print out the result, right? So this is a really cool feature. I strongly encourage you to play around with workspaces just so that you understand how they work. The Rust Analyzer extension for VS Code really seems to work well with workspaces as well. So when you're resolving different crates or resolving exported modules and things of that nature, you know, the Rust Analyzer extension really seems to work well with that. And the Cargo CLI also knows how to kind of determine any issues with your workspace configuration. And it's always going to recommend to you that you add your list of crates into the workspace members here. Now, something else you can actually do is to explicitly exclude certain crates. So previously we had default members here where we can do, uh, you know, cargo test, cargo build, and it's only going to operate on the default members. But what if we wanted to exclude certain packages? Well, what we can do is say exclude and then we could say, well, even though trevlib07 is one of my members here, I actually want to exclude that from any operations. So now if we do cargo clean followed by a cargo build operation, you should see that trevlib07 is not being built. And we're even receiving a warning from my app 01 because my app 01 actually has a dependency on that particular crate. So now if we go up to the shared target directory up here where all of our, bi our compiled binary files are, we should see under debug here that my app 01 has been compiled, but we don't have that extra library being compiled anywhere in here. So if you want to explicitly exclude things, you can go to your virtual workspace file here and add in this exclusion. You can also use wildcards to a certain extent within these paths as well. So if you wanted to exclude anything that starts with trevlib, for example, I think we can put an asterisk here. We could try doing that again. And it looks like in this particular case, it is actually still compiling Trevlib 01 right here. Not totally sure why that is, but there is documentation about when the uh, wildcards are supported. So somewhere in here, there is documentation on using something like an asterisk. Let's do a search for asterisk here. Of course, now I can't find it now that I'm actually recording a video, but uh, feel free to do some research on that and figure out how to use things like, oh, there it is, glob patterns is what they call it. So asterisk and question mark. And that is apparently supported only in the members list here. So just be aware of that. If you want to include everything starting with Trevlib, then we could say, uh, let's exclude Trevlib 07. But up here, we'll just say include all of Trevlibs, and then we don't have to specify them individually. And it doesn't seem to like this because it can't get the dependency here from my app 01. Let's go ahead and remove that dependency from my app 01. And we'll just have a reference to Trevlib. So hopefully that'll resolve that error. And sure enough, now you can see. Technically, Trevlib07 and Trevlib01 are included in the virtual workspace here because we used that asterisk or globbing pattern. But because we had Trevlib07 under the exclude section right here, that's why it was not being compiled. So again, there's lots of little different you know, knobs and levers that you can use to configure your cargo workspace and kind of customize it to section off your code into different crates. Now, one of my viewers had actually asked me to drill a little bit more into modules as well. And so we, I, do, I do have another video that talks about modules over here in my uh, Rust playlist right here. So if we do a search for module, I have something called Rust functions and modules right here. But I just wanted to show you for context how this works inside of workspaces. So once again, we have a workspace and we have four different crates. We have a single application crate or binary crate, and then we have three lib crates, my test lib 09, trevlib 01, and 07. So let's say that under trevlib 07, and I'm not going to exclude that anymore. Let's say that we have our source file. Actually, this is a binary project, not a lib. Let's go back to trevlib01, go under source. So we've got lib.rs, right? And our application, as long as we had a dependency declared in cargo.toml, we were able to use 
the trevlib01 add function directly from my app01, right? So libraries can reference other libraries, applications can reference libraries and things like that. But let's say that we wanted to kind of segment out some code into a separate file here. So what we'll do is create a new file, and this is going to actually be a separate module. So I'll call this mathops.rs, and then I'm going to move this add function right here. And we're going to take that, and we're going to just get rid of these tests so we don't have any you know, resolution issues. And I'm going to move add into this mathops module. Now, car, the uh, Rust toolchain is going to look for lib.rs here. So what we need to do is lib.rs is kind of our entry point into the library. So we have to inform the library in lib.rs that we have a separate module called mathops. So what we'll do is say mod mathops, and you can see it automatically resolved that because it can see that file on the local file system. And then we're going to put a pub in front of it as well, because we need to make sure that since we have external crates that are depending on functionality, we have to make sure that we do pub mod in order to make those members publicly accessible. So back under my app 01, we're going to go to trevlib01, but now we're going to go to a child module called mathops. And under mathops, we can reference the add function and do add five and 10. And if we do a cargo run, that should work perfectly fine right here, right? All right, there is one other way to create modules as well though. The one option is to simply create a new file here. But another way, if you have lots of different files that need to be included as part of a child module, you can actually create a directory here and we'll call it mathops, and then we'll move that file into there. But check out what happens. The resolution breaks, right? So what you actually have to do is if you create the subdirectory, you actually have to call the file mod.rs. So Rust is going to look specifically for this file under the directory called mod.rs. And you can see as soon as we rename that file, the module is automatically resolved. So we don't have to place any code directly inside of lib.rs. We can actually place that code into a child module, into a separate directory, out of sight, out of mind. But then in lib.rs here, we basically just declare that there is a child module that has some code that we need to export so that other crates can access it. All right, so I think that should pretty much take care of everything here. If we go back and actually try to do a cargo run, everything still works perfectly fine because we didn't change the name of the module. All we did is we refactored it under a separate directory here. All right, so I think that's everything that I wanted to cover as far as virtual workspaces go in Rust. I hope that this video has been helpful to you and has taught you something new. Again, please leave a like on this video and all the other videos that really helps grow the channel. Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought of this video and also subscribe to the channel and set notifications to on so that you get notified anytime that I publish a new video. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.